Good morning, I'm Robert Dean Steele, and this is your November 28th prayer time together. And I'm really looking forward to spending some time to you today. And today, Lord, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to spend some time together, to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to spend time, Lord, of course, putting together both the Word of God and as well, Lord, this opportunity to pray. Now, Father, we thank you today that as we grow in the Word of God, we want to not only, Lord, hear the Word of God, but we also want to do the Word of God. It was James who said so concisely, precisely, and as well, consistently, and also straight to the point. He said this, you say that you have faith, show it by what you do. And Lord, that's our prayer and our aim and our goal today, is that Lord, that's exactly what we're going to do. We are going to show it, Lord, in our lifestyle today. Father, I was reading today that in different areas that we can, uh, you know, for example, at Christmas time, Lord, we should be focusing on more acts of kindness. And Lord, we know that when we open our lives to you, you're going to give us all kinds of opportunities. And we're grateful for those opportunities. Now, Lord, before we do anything, of course, we've got to be prepared. We need to be prayed up and ready to go and do what it is that, Lord, you're calling us to do. Live the lifestyle that, Lord, you've called us to live. We want to do that today, Lord. We want to make sure that everything we do, everything we say, and everything that we live, Lord, would bring honor and praise and glory to your name. With that thought in mind, Lord, today, would you help us, Lord, to walk in your incredible love? Father, we know that our faith is always demonstrated by acts of love and kindness. And we're not just talking about ra random acts of kindness, but Lord, we're talking about uh, decided opportunities to speak into people's lives and to touch them for Jesus Christ. Lord, that's what we want to do today. We want to go into each and every life situation, bringing your grace, bringing your mercy, bringing your love into people's situations. So Father, right now, we're going to prepare our hearts to do that. It is in the place of prayer that we do these things where we say, okay, God, now, in this moment, would you lead and guide me and direct me today to people that you want us to minister? Now, we can look at the life of Jesus Christ for an example. Jesus was a man who spent many hours in prayer. Now, he would get alone with you, and he would be asking questions such as, Lord, what is it you want me to do today? The thing that I find so fascinating about Jesus' life is that he fluidly and almost effortly went from one situation to the next. People would come to him and ask him to do certain things, and he seemed to have just the right answer at the right time. Now, how did that happen? That happened in the area of prayer. His desire was to do the will of his Father. Now, Father, we, we don't know exactly what he communicated to you, but we have a little indication when it came to uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. It, it never tells us any place else what Jesus actually said, except in the Lord's Prayer and in the Garden of Gethsemane. We get a wonderful picture of what Jesus' prayer life actually looked like. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was in the major crisis of his life and also a major decision of his life, he said something like this, Not my will, but thine be done. His human part said, Lord, if this cup can pass for me, let it pass. But Lord, not my will, but thine be done. I have a suspicion. I can't 100% confirm it, Lord, but I do know this, that when Jesus gave the Lord's Prayer, one of those uh, part of that prayer was, thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, I think that that is a wonderful picture of how we need to approach every prayer time that we have. That we say, okay, God, today, I know that my life is going to be fluid. I don't know who you're going to bring in my life. I don't know what direction it's going to go moment by moment. We make our plans. That's right. We make our plans. But the Bible says it's the Lord who determines our steps. Now, what that simply means is we can make a plan for today and say, okay, this is what I plan to do today. This is how my life is going to look like today. But we need to recognize that there are going to be circumstances and situations. There are going to be people. There are going to be things that are going to happen. For example, you could go to the uh, to the mail today and all of a sudden there is a letter or a bill or something that's going to change your life. All of a sudden you open up the uh, utility bill and it's substantially higher. The first thing you're going to need to do is figure out how you're going to pay for it. Uh, especially if you've been living on what we would call paycheck to paycheck or famine to famine situation. We know that in the uh, instant of the uh, squirrel or maybe the ant that they spent all summer, well, the summer season was on, they were putting things away. So when the winter season came, then they were prepared. Well, Lord, a lot of us people don't have that resources or we don't take that time to do that. We're not following Dave Ramsey's idea of putting aside money so that we would be ready for the crisis. But Lord, besides that, we need to recognize that, Lord, our lives are fluid. Something could happen today that could absolutely change everything. We could be driving down the road and, for example, here today in the area where I live, we are having a snow time right now. We're dealing with icy roads and you could be driving down the road and all of a sudden you slide into the ditch or you could slide into another individual and that's going to change everything. It's going to change your day. It could change how you are. Your life could be actually changed that way. Lord, we need to have that fluidity of life. And also, we need to say and remember that the steps of a good person are ordered by the Lord. And we need to apply that into our life situation. How do we get prepared to it for a, a little bit? By praying. By spending time alone with you and saying, God, I can plan certain things, but I also need to recognize that there is a fluidity in my life. Now, the one constant that we have in our lives is the fact that the Lord is never going to leave us. The Lord is never going to forsake us. That is a wonderful promise. That means that throughout this day, and we need to recognize that this is the only day that we have. Lord, I saw a video just over the weekend of a pastor who was reminding his congregation about the fact that when we receive an invitation from the Lord, it may be a one-time deal. Now, I love how Paul says this. He says simply this, this is your day of salvation. Paul knew that uh, life was so um, fluid and also as well uh, unpredictable that the only opportunity that we may have to give our lives to Jesus Christ could be the moment that is presented because there's no guarantee on life. We don't know if we're even going to make it throughout the day. That is, is, of course, in the hands of the Lord. So when we get up in the morning, like I am right now, I'm saying, Lord, I know that this is the only day that I have. And so, Lord, allow me today to be ready to give that reason for of the hope that lies within me. Because I never know when someone will, that conversation that I'm having with someone will turn to eternal things. And when it turns to eternal things, I need to be ready to share the hope that lies within me. In fact, Paul says you need to be ready in season and out of season. That means that when the opportunity comes, it usually comes when you least expect it. And when it comes, you need to share the hope that lies within you. But Lord, 
that all happens because we've spent time with you. We've said, Lord, I am allowing you to lead my steps today. And I want your kingdom come and I want your will to be done in my life today. There's an old song that says simply this, in my life, Lord, be glorified today. And that's what you want. You want the Lord to be uh, glorified in our lives today. And that should be our prayer today, Lord. And also as well, Lord, we need to recognize that as we have spent time with you, then we're not entirely surprised when something happens that is contrary to our schedule. Father, that is, of course, what I talk about, the fluidity of life, that ebb and flow that happens with life. Lord, we know that at any moment something could happen that could change the direction of the day or even the direction of our lives. I, I remember when my brother-in-law, whose name was Dave, and uh, when he received the information that he was now having cancer. For many, many years, he had been away from the Lord. In fact, about 30 years away from the Lord. And then he got his cancer um, news, and it changed everything for him. And that day, he went out, and he began to have one of those interperspective moments. And he began to think about, okay, I have cancer. And the um, doctor told him, Dave, I think it's terminal. And Dave began to think about that. He began to think about his life. He began to think about the last 30 years. You see, when I was a pastor in the city of Edmonton, Dave happened to be one of my young people, or I should say young adults, within my group. And he married my wife's sister. And when he married them, they or when they got married, they were Christians. But then after a year or so, after he had uh, um, uh, been married, he made a decision that he was no longer going to go to church. And then it, he began a slow descent into basically backsliding. And then when he got that uh, information that he had cancer, he went out and instead of cursing God and getting mad, he made a decision. And that decision was, you know what? I have got to follow the Lord. And in that uh, interperspective time, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. Well, for the next two and a half years, he made a decision. Now, many of us probably would have not agreed with his decision, but when he started feeling better, he went back to work. And for the next two years, he was a strong influence for the Lord in his work situation. And uh, he went back to church, didn't come to my church, but uh, he went back to church and uh, he got prayed for. And for the next two and a half years, he was a strong believer. It was wonderful. Before that, when we would have family outings, Dave would be the, you know, one fighting and talking against Christianity. It wasn't that way anymore. Dave would be talking about the good things of God, and it was wonderful to have those conversations. Well, of course, when he passed away, he passed quietly and also as well presently in the Lord. The last two and a half years of his life was an absolute miracle, and I had the privilege of doing his funeral. And when I was doing that funeral, there were over 400 to 500 people that packed out that funeral home. And uh, about 400 of them were um, members of the, uh, of the particular um, job that he had, the vocation that he had. He was working for one of our local companies that was, you know, a gas supplier. And uh, he was a supervisor in the last couple of years. And people came up to both myself and to his wife and members of our family and said, Dave was an incredible 
mentor. And in the last two and a half years that he was alive, he was a totally different man. And they had come to his funeral because he had touched their lives so powerfully for the Lord. Now, that was a wonderful testimony. You know, a man for 30 years was away from God, had this uh, devastating news, and instead of cursing God or getting mad, he just simply said, you know, Lord, I, I was dealt with this hand, and I'm going to glorify you, and I'm going to follow you for the rest of my days. And that's exactly what he did. I remember even the night we were invited to go and visit him, and we had no idea that that would be the last time that we would see him. And we had this wonderful conversation with him, and he said, don't worry about me. He says, I know I'm not, you know, 100% right now. He actually was rallying that night. And uh, we were excited about what was going on. We had a wonderful conversation. We did not know that when we left at 10 o'clock at night that uh, we would receive a phone call at 1.30 in the morning telling us that Dave had passed into the presence of the Lord. He had told his wife, go home. He says, I'll be here in the morning, not knowing that uh, the Lord would come to him that night and say, Dave, it is time for you to go home. And th when the nurse came in, she said, I checked on him at midnight. She says, and I went to check on him at 1230. And she says, he was gone. And she said he had such a peaceful look on his face. And when we heard that from the nurse, we, we just rejoiced in the fact that the Lord decided to take him home. He was rallying. He was talking with us. And then just a couple of hours later, the Lord and him decided to go home. And Father, I remember it was a powerful, incredible funeral that we had. And it wasn't a time of, of, of sadness, but it was a time of celebration and also a time of memorial. How so many people came afterwards and told us what a wonderful influence Dave had been in their lives in the last two years. They said he was heroic in the face of the cancer. They knew that he was dealing with pain from time to time, and he was. He was living in pain all the time, and uh, he was heavily medicated, but he was able to do his job. He was able to be a mentor. He was always kind. He was always loving. He would talk about the Lord with people. People would often say, Dave, how can you be so positive when you have this thing hanging over? He says, listen, Cancer is what I have. It's not defining who I have. Dave also became a man of the word of God and a man of prayer. And today his wife is a Sunday school uh, superintendent in our church. She as well came back to the Lord and is serving the Lord after 30 years of not serving the Lord. It was a very uncomfortable situation whenever we would gather together with them and we would have conversations because conversations always turn to the things of the Lord in our family gatherings because we're Christians and we love to talk about the things of the Lord. And it was uncomfortable. But after Dave came to know the Lord, it was a totally different situation. He loved the Word of God. He loved to discuss the things of God and would often, you know, tell us what is going on in his life. He would tell us what was happening with the cancer. But he said all the time, he says, I may have the disease, but it doesn't define who I am. And that was what people would say to us at his funeral. They said, he said often, they would ask him how he was doing. They would ask him about his treatments. And he was very forthright and very, you know, open about what was going on in his life. But he would often say, listen, this cancer is what I have. It is not who I am. And they would remember that. And we need to recognize that just because we have circumstances that are not pleasant, just because we go through difficult times, that is not who we are. Who we are is 
a, a conqueror in Jesus Christ. Today, I want you and myself to remember that we are not victims. We are victors today. We are not being overcome. We are overcomers. We are not being conquered. We are more than conquerors. And the testimony that I shared with you today in this time and place of prayer was to encourage you that no matter what your circumstances are, God is there. We have a entire book that basically shows us that good things can actually happen, or bad things, I should say, can happen to good people. We have the book of Job, where Job, I mean, he is going on in his life. He's offering prayers for his family. He's a godly example. The Lord has blessed him. And he has no idea of a conversation that is happening in heaven and how that God actually allowed Satan to afflict him. And when Job was fully afflicted by boils and losing everything. His wife comes up to him and says, you know what? You know, you should just curse God and die because this is not good situation. And Job's response is, wife, woman, he says, God gives us the good and the bad. And we have to Thank him no matter what. You know, Paul put it this way, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God for those who are in Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean that all things happen to us are good, but all things will work together for good. That's what Romans 8.28 says. On the other side, whether it is, you know, a miraculous healing or in the case of my brother-in-law, a miraculous uh, homecoming, either way, we win. Dave the, he succumbed to the cancer, but the, it, it, it was a miraculous homecoming. And the testimony that he left was incredible. And uh, he was also heroic in his fight against the cancer. He did lose the battle, but in other words, he won because he's now in the presence of the Lord. Well, Job of course, was faced with this situation. And it was interesting that Job often monologued about what happened, but he didn't blame God and he didn't curse God through those monologues. And on the other side of the situation, after the Lord had restored him, and the interesting thing about this book is God never explained why it happened. Now, we, of course, being third persons, we're watching this narrative, we're listening to this narrative, and we know that on the other side, Job did understand. But in the middle of the narrative, God didn't explain. When God came along and began to talk to Job, he said, Job, where were you when I did all of these things? And at the end, Job just basically says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now that I see you, I repent with sackcloth and ashes. He says, Lord, I've been humbled by this encounter. I mean, let's face it, Job was the most righteous man in that generation. There was no man like Job. He was blameless, and God even bragged about him. And then when it was all said and done, God restored him. He gave him back his health. He gave him back a family. He had three beautiful daughters that were the envy of all that part of the world. God gave him twice as much back. Why? Because Job was, of course, blameless and righteous and above reproach through the situation. We can grow through our situations. We can become who God intended us to be. You know what? Whatever you're going through today, remember this. It does not necessarily define who you are. How you react is also going to determine what direction you are going to see your life go. If you receive bad news today and you get up there and you jump up and down and curse and, and swear and get mad at God and everybody else, guess what? You've already lost. But if you just simply say, Lord, I don't understand why this is happening to me, but I trust you. You see, Job said something very powerful. He said, even though he slays me, I 
will trust him. Father, today, thank you that no matter what comes our way, we're going to trust you. We're going to trust you with all our hearts. We're not going to lean to our own understanding. We're simply going to acknowledge you and ask you, Lord, to direct our path. We want to be a Dave. Lord, we want to live our lives above the circumstances. Lord, we know that whatever we face does not necessarily define us. It is not defining who we are. It's what's happening to us. But Lord, our trust is in you today. We're not leaning to any of the things that we would normally lean on. We are leaning on the everlasting arms. There's a wonderful song that says, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own. And the joy I share as we tarry there, none other can ever know. That is, of course, from the song In the Garden. Lord, today, as we've spent time with you, thank you that this is a time and a moment, Lord, of victory. This is a time and moment of planning for the day to be not reactive, but proactive, to be like our Savior who wanted to do the will of his Father and knew that life was fluid and unexpected. But trust the Lord when it came to the activities of the day. And whenever he was faced with something, he rose above the circumstance. Why? Because he had spent time with his Father. And he said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And that's what we want, Lord. We want your kingdom to come. We want your will to be done. We want the righteousness, peace, joy, and power that defines, of course, Lord, a righteous individual and the kingdom of God to be established in our lives today. Thank you, Lord, for this time and place of prayer and the examples that we have and have expressed today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, of course, if you like what you've been hearing, I would encourage you to press the like button and also subscribe to my YouTube channel. My name is Robert Dean Steele. Thank you for spending time with me today, and God bless you.